had a client back in the day. Um, and I remember one morning I served him pineapples, fresh, mm-hmm. fresh pineapples. And he said, what's that? <laughs> Hi, I'm Terrell Turner, the host of the Business Talk Library, and today I have a guest on, and this one caught my attention because I am a huge believer that we have to take care of ourselves in a healthier way, and you know, when I saw this Eating Well with Chef Cordell, I mean, it really caught my attention, so welcome to the show, Chef Cordell. I mean, I appreciate that, uh, real very happy to be here with you, brother, very happy to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about, you know, your background and, and your business, like how you got into this business. Uh, sure. Well, I've always been a big fan of food, um, even though I don't look like it <laughs> at all. Uh, like, like we'll put a pin in there for like a second. But, you know, people have always said never trust a skinny, skinny chef. Well, you know, I don't think I'm skinny, <laughs> but I'm not overweight <laughs> by any metrics at all. But, you know, it's 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 all about what you put into your body. But I got into cooking uh, probably when I was 13. My mother allowed my sister and I to participate in uh, Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, I was asked to make the cornbread dressing. And when I tell you it was the worst thing I've ever made in my life, (laughs) that stands true to this day. It was absolutely horrible. But it got me into uh, wanting to kind of learn more about how to put things together to create something. Um, So a couple years Later, I started a quasi company called Cordell's Cookies. So I sold uh, chocolate chip, peanut butter, butter, oatmeal raisin, brownies to family members, church members, people I went to school with, like what have you. So that got me into the mode of entrepreneurship. Uh, a few years later, or in between that time, my neighborhood in Chicago, where I'm from on the south side, we lost our only grocery store that was within a mile from our house. So wow. when you, yeah, when you, <clears throat> When you don't have a, a grocery store within a mile or so from where you live, that neighborhood is generally designated as a food desert. So where you don't have any fresh, affordable, nutritious things or fruits or vegetables to be able to get within a mile from your place. So um, I noticed that, but didn't immediately notice the changes that were happening. But years later, I looked at my family and looked at other people I knew at church and beyond that, everybody was suffering from the same thing. Mm -hmm. hypertension, obesity, and diabetes type 2. So years after that, I combined my wanting to cook and my affinity for how we can use food to use it as medicine. How can we create a business out of that to then be able to help our people? So, uh, and I didn't really have to go further than my family. Um, uh, We've always been told that type 2 and high blood pressure and obesity runs in the family. I think that's completely false. I think that people may have a higher propensity to get it based upon diet choices that they've made throughout those years. But just like you can eat your way into obesity, hypertension, and diabetes type 2, you can eat your way out of it as well. So I started my business after working in a few restaurants in Chicago. I started my business in 2008, um, have been in it mostly full-time since. We started off doing catering in the beginning, doing personal chef work for some of the athletes in Chicago to keep them on par for their sports. Uh, and it kind of, and we started doing cook, uh, cooking classes at Whole Foods and what have you, and kind of branched out into what it is now. So at this point, what we do is we focus on providing healthy culinary education to adults and children. On the adult end, we work with companies that hire us to come in and teach their employees how to go about putting together pragmatic techniques and recipes to be able to produce healthier meals for themselves and their families. On the employee end, of course, that makes them um, healthier. On the employer end, you know, they generally get a more productive employee, people that don't take off work that much, and and it also helps to lower their insurance premium. On the other end, and working with kids, we uh, work with the school systems to be able to offer menu and recipe development which would then produce healthier meals for the students. So 
that's what we do in a nut, nutshell, yeah. Okay, and I think that there's a lot of value there. I mean, I, I want to go back to something you pointed out or you brought up about, you know, just that process of, just, of improving, you know, the quality of your health by being more mindful of the, the things that you put into your body. I mean, how was that journey for you kind of, you know, coming to that aha moment and then starting to change that for yourself? Um, that's a good, good question. Um, I don't want to be fat. I mean, I hate to put it, I, 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 I hate to put it that way. And not that that necessarily is a bad thing, but you know, once you see enough family members pass away or get sick, or, you know, people who's had their limbs cut off, you know, due to diet stuff, you know, and it's like, well, how much control do I have over this? Now, for instance, if you're living in a food desert, you know, those are areas also that uh, people don't always have access to transportation. So whether it's their own or public transportation. So when you don't have those things, you factor all of that in, you're relegated to what's in your neighborhood, which is generally the not so good stuff. So I can understand to a degree, you know, why we are or how we got to where we are. But in the end, you know, it's a choice, just like everything else is. It's a choice. You know, how I look at it, uh, either you're going to pay for it now, maybe pay a few extra bucks here, or you're going to pay later in damaged health. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I would much rather at this point, and not that everything has to be organic. So let's back, back, back it up a bit. When people think health, they think, oh my God, I'm going to blow this budget. <laughs> not necessarily. Um, they've made it easy for us, though, to think that because they have a dollar menu at every restaurant that that there is. Mm-hmm. And these restaurants are in the neighborhood, in, in our neighbor, neighborhood. So if I'm a single parent, I got two or three kids at home and I just got off work. I'm working longer hours for less pay, you know, and now I have to go home after working longer hours to see my kid. But on my re- route home, I'm going to pass four or five fast food restaurants that all have dollar menus. So I can either A, take 10, 10 bucks and feed the people that are at my home or I can take two hours or, or an hour or 30 minutes and actually go to the grocery store and come home and cook. But after working all these hours, it's, I'm probably tired. So I'm going to, more than likely, I'm going to choose Route A versus Route B, which takes a little more time. But in the end, um, you will get much better results. So, mm-hmm. And I think that that, that is a, a, a definitely a trade-off that people really wrestle with and something that I I was talking to my wife about was you know I think a lot of times people do have a misconception about what it's going to cost to actually eat healthier because that was something that her and I started you know a couple of years ago is and, and we just started you know simply by just saying hey I just need to eat and increase. We're going to start with increasing the number of vegetables that we have on our plate. Let's, let's start there. Um, and what we realized is like, man, it's not as expensive as he thought it was going to be to start eating healthier. Mm-hmm. You're right. You're right. I mean, it, it, there, are, there are so many factors that go into it, and we don't have the time to go through every single factor. You know, a lot of it is what we're accustomed to. So, for instance, I can, I can tell you, Terrell, you need to eat healthier. Now, depending upon what type of person you are, you may take it, oh, my God, I'm not eating healthy. I'm a, I'm a bad person. You know, what am I going to do? So you, you see health in the news, and it seems so gigantic, like you have to do this, you have to do that. No, you need to just start. Mm-hmm. You know, one thing that helped me out, for instance, uh, so my breakfast on a, generally on a daily basis is, I start off with three or four pieces of fruit. This is after I have my water to clean my system out, I have my coffee. I generally start off with about three or four pieces of fruit, at least. So whether it's a couple apples, a couple of kiwi, and what have you, and then I slowly work my way into food. So after that point, I'll have a few eggs, some brown rice, and asparagus or broccoli for breakfast. And it sounds odd, but once I consciously say, okay, I'm not, I, I cannot continue to eat in a way that's not going to benefit my body any and expect anything different. So I have to do something. So I started by eating more fruit in the morning. Mm-hmm. And I said, oh, oh wow, I guess I don't just have to eat asparagus for dinner. I guess I can't eat it for breakfast, huh? 
Mm-hmm. I mean, are the, are the police going to come out of the side <laughs> of my kitchen and say, no, you can't. Have I mean, so it's, it's just mentally making that shift. That's mm-hmm. we're making light of it, but you just have to kind of turn that corner like a bit. It's, and what it comes down to for me, do I want to live or do I want to die? And I hate to say it so bluntly, but these choices will make a difference. So for instance, I stopped eating meat with breakfast. Now I like turkey sausage and, and, and other things like that, but something I uh, saw a few years back, there was this um, video, I can't think of the gentleman who put it out, but he said, you're waking up in the morning and you're ascending, you're going up. Now you're putting something in your body that's already died, mm-hmm. that's going down. So, you know, whether it's bacon, turkey meat, or what have you. So you're going up, this is going down. So now you're going to hit a crash at some point and you're, you're not going to be where you would like, like to be. So I stopped eating meat for breakfast period. Um, mm-hmm. And I start to feel better now. Like I, I constantly feel like I'm still going, going up versus having that meat eight o'clock in the morning and now I'm stuck for the next hour trying to wake myself back up again, if that makes sense. Okay, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense. Now, something you talked about, um, and I know, you know, I had a conversation before this interview um, that I wanted to hit on a little bit more sure. about the programs that you do for children and schools, because I mean, that's a very big thing of school systems are, you know, trying to find, you know, ways to, to you know, give their children a healthier diet. Like, what are, what has that experience been like for you working with school systems? Uh, it's it's been great and it's also been eye opening. Um, so I took a break from my business a couple years ago because I moved from one state to the next state and knew that I needed time to kind of figure out what the market was. So I took on a job as a regional child nutrition director for a school system. I was based in um, Roanoke Rapids. I don't know if you know where that is. Roanoke mm-hmm. Rapids, North Carolina Eastern. So a very rural like area. Uh, going out there was very eye-opening for me. Um, I didn't really recognize um, how much children depended on the school system to be able to eat. Mm-hmm. So when we when we think about the pandemic situ- situations that's going going on now, you know, I feel really bad for the uh, uh, children that don't have a gracious socio-economic back background because they depend upon these school meals to be able to eat. Uh, but to more specifically answer your question though, and in, in, in working with the school systems, it was different because a lot of them were accustomed to eating out of the can or eating out of the boxes, just kind of take this, take this, we have a, we have a meal. And, and um, the focus when I was running, my portion of it was, wasn't necessarily before I came in, it wasn't on the quality, it was on can we get this meal as cheap as possible? Gotcha. And it was just about the numbers. And at least the kids are getting fed because they're not getting fed at home. So at least they're getting fed. When I was brought in, my task amongst many things was to be able to create menus that were fresher, that were focused on, you know, uh, meals and what ingredients that would be able to keep them stim- stimulated in the classroom. So for instance, you have certain fruits, vegetables that are good for memory, uh, that are good for focus and di- different things like that. So part, part of my task was to A, get the menus out of the doldrums of boxes and cans. Can we turn this into fresh stuff? And it was a challenge initially because, you know, when, when you're accustomed to eating crab macaroni and cheese, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It's, 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 it's different now when we're actually using real cheese. You yeah. know, or, you know, if people call like, what is this? For instance, I had a, had a client back in the day, um, and I remember one morning I served him pineapples, fresh, mm-hmm. fresh pineapples. And he said, what's that? <laughs> I'm thinking, dude, you're like 25 years old, but okay, I, this is what I was thinking of myself. <laughs> but, I, but I had to check myself, because he was like, I don't, I've never seen this, like this. Mm-hmm. He was used to fruit out of a can. Now, I had the pineapple still in the shell. So I cut okay. it out, cut it up, and put it back in the uh, shell. Mm-hmm. But he was used to pineapple coming out of a can. Gotcha. And it really opened my eyes um, to, you know, coming from different areas of town where you may live in those food, food deserts or you may not be exposed to these things. Once you are exposed to them, you're kind of like, what in the world is this? 
So, you know, it was uh, different, but I think we did meet some success in working with the school system because we were able to uh, turn the children on to something different after beating the re resistance that them and their parents initially gave us. Once they actually tried the foods more often, I think that they liked them more, and I still see remnants of that um, to this day in working with those school systems. So. Okay. And then I guess when you started moving into working with, let's say, corporations, because I know that was a huge value. When I worked at General Electric, that was a, a big thing that they did at GE, where you could go down to the health center and actually the, um, they would host cooking sessions for the employees and it helped out with the company's insurance because you know, you're promoting more healthier habits within. Mm -hmm. So the company got a benefit as well as, you know, the employees got a chance to try some new dishes and they got a chance to learn about some new healthier dishes. How was that experience for you? Oh, that's been great. Uh, that's, that's the crux of my business at this point. So um, I started off doing individual or public cooking classes for the public. So um, I was teaching at Whole Foods back in Chicago as an independent kind of contractor and then started doing them on my own at various locations. Um, I in, enjoy teaching as a whole. So I actually have a class in about two hours here as well. Uh, but I enjoy teaching very much. I love working with individuals, but I decided to work with the companies because I felt like we could have a larger in, impact on, on people. So most people go to work. So they're going to be there eight, nine, 10 hours a day. Why not catch them in an environment that they're already in? They're already paid to be, to be there, so they're not going to go anywhere. That could be a benefit to the employer and to the employee, and the employee doesn't have to pay anything for it. And we have a live captive, captive audience all in one place. So, you know, I started, I dibbled and dabbled in corporate wellness uh, about five or six years back, but once I saw the effect that we can have, we can have a much bigger effect in the same amount of time. I can spend and be hired out to do, you know, a class for one hour for 10, ten people mm -hmm. as a group, sure. But if I can get an entire office of 50 people, you mm -hmm. know, where they're a captive audience, they don't have to invest anything to it other than the willingness to learn how to do something different. And the employer will get benefit. We saw that as a win-win. So, so yeah, I mean, I've, I've definitely in, uh, enjoyed doing the corporate wellness. Uh, we work with right now some insurance brokers, uh, municipalities, uh, some Fortune 100, 500 companies. So we've been very, very fortunate. And during this COVID time, the most important thing is to be as nimble for us as possible. So we started doing more virtual corporate wellness too. So Okay. So I saw, I came across it because I saw in a video you did about, um, I guess, properly picking a pineapple. Um, yes. Now, how often are you doing videos on social media? I am looking to do them about three to four times a week. Uh, since I just started doing, as we did mention um, a few moments ago, I, I reopened the forum to doing public classes. So knowing that people are at home now during this COVID time, We've been doing individual and small group classes for in, for for the public now. Um, so we're uh, doing those about three three to four times a week. We like to keep the balance between doing a meal and then maybe offering tips. So every other day, bouncing off of those, those two. But just looking to give out as much helpful information as possible. Okay. And then where can people find you? Like they're going on social media. What do they search for to find your your videos? Okay, sure. So you can go directly to the website, which is www.chefcordell.com. That's C-H-E-F-C-O-R-D-E-L-L.com. You can find us on Instagram at Chef Cordell, Facebook, Eating Well with Chef Cordell Consulting, LinkedIn, Cordell McGarry, dash Eating Well with Chef Cordell Consulting. Uh, that's where the information is. Uh, you can also go to our U YouTube channel as well, which we just started a couple of weeks ago. That's eating well with Chef Cordell as well. So, okay. if you yeah, if you Google eating well with Chef Cordell, you're gonna find find this. So yeah. <laughs> okay, awesome, awesome. And then one question I like to ask all the business sure. owners that I have on the show is, you know, since you've been in this journey of going from an idea to building a business around it what is at least one thing that you've kind of learned in that process of building a business? Oof. Um, 
I can only give you one. <laughs> uh, man, there's so many. There's so many. Um, one that sticks out to me, something that my father told me that I guess relates to life and the business. You know, it's not about how many times you get knocked down. It's how quickly that you get up. You know, in business specifically, you're going to fail sometimes. I mean, it's going to happen. And there are going to be some things that you think that you're doing properly that you're not. You know, um, you, you're going to be hum, humiliated. <laughs> uh, I, I have a few, few times that popped into my head when I first started. I thought I was the hot stuff. So, you know, I've been humiliated. I've been short, shortchanged, you know, but I kept going. I kept going because I knew that what I was doing was right. I had to change up how I did it at times, and that, that had to be okay. I had to be willing to be flexible like enough to know when something is not working in a particular way and be willing to do something different. But in the end, though, I had to keep going. I had to keep believing, you know, um, but I had to keep learning, too. I had to keep learning, and, and I had to, to surround myself with people that knew more than me. Mm-hmm. So... But, but we could, we I, I could do another 45 minutes on that. <laughs> yeah. And I think that, that those are some very, very, very good things. I think a lot of people are finding themselves really having to pull on those things right now. Like with all that's going on with the pandemic, I mean, how people approach their business is drastically different. And, and I think uh, there are a lot of businesses that are taking huge steps back. I mean, Mm -hmm. they're doing the right thing to protect the health of themselves and the health of their employees, but they're taking a huge hit right now. And I think that's going to be a very telling thing of, okay, after this is over, you know, what do you do? Do you pick yourself back up and do you continue moving forward? So I think that one is a very good point. Yeah. I mean, and, and everybody knows their own individual financial situation better than anybody else. So Mm -hmm. I can't tell people what to do on that. You know, I just know if you believe in it bad enough, you're willing to put in that work and you're willing to treat it like a business and not a hobby. um, You're destined to do what you're looking to do. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Chef Cordell, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, Thank you for sharing your wisdom and, and definitely to all those that are listening, um, definitely check out the videos that he's posting and check out the content that he's sharing and and the classes as well, um, because they're really good stuff out there.